Okay, cool. Uh, so I just want to welcome everybody to, I think, week number three of our discussion of R for Data Science book club. Today, Austin Mangelson. Is that how you say your last name? Yeah, that's right. Mangelson. All right. Got it. Awesome. Great. So Austin's going to lead our conversation of chapter number three, data transformation. So I'm just going to turn it over to Austin. He'll lead the discussion. If anybody has any questions, feel free to jump off of, uh, you know, jump off a of mute, or even if you want to open up your camera, do so. But I'll also be monitoring the chat if there's any questions that people might have and want to ask there. So, all right. So Austin, I'm just going to turn it over to you. All right. Perfect. That sounds good. Um, should I, let's see if I can screen share. Mm -hmm. um, get the right tab. Okay. Everybody see this? This is pre the prerequisites tab. We're good. Okay. All right. So yeah, I'm I'm super excited to be teaching uh, talking about this one. Um, I feel like data transformation is kind of at the heart of um, exploratory data analysis, being able to manipulate data frames and um, just get different visuals on on your data and glean different insights from it. Um, so it's it's all done through the dplyr package. Um, it's part of the tidyverse package. So if you just install tidyverse, it'll come with it. Um, you can also install, or, yeah, not install, but um, is it load? Is that the right word? Load the dplyr library specifically if you wanted to do that. So either way works, uh, tidyverse or dplyr. Um, so so basically. I guess going back real quick, it's it's a way to manipulate different columns and rows. It's kind of how it's organized in the textbook is the functions that manipulate um, your data by rows and then by columns. Um, and we're going to start with rows, I believe, um, using the New York City flights data set. Um, so this one you can also install, uh, install packages NYC flights 13 and then load it with the library call. Um, and then, like right off the bat, there's a couple different ways that you can view the data set. Um, just putting in the name of the the data table in your console, just put flights. Um, I really like the view option because it puts it in more of a, like it says here, a spreadsheet view. Um, I find it a little bit easier that way to, to see what's going on with the data and it's organized really well. Um, and just like anything else in R, uh, you can you can put the question mark in front of it and get a little bit more information about what the columns are if you're confused about, um, you know, what is this representing? Um, sometimes it's kind of hard to know and, until you've had some time playing around with it. Um, so getting like a, a, a overview of what's inside of your data set, um, there's a couple different calls here. Um, n row gives you the number of rows, n call gives you the number of columns. Um, they all kind of, it's all kind of different ways to give you the same information. Um, also, if you, let's see if it says here, if you just put in the data set flights and hit enter, then it says here the number of rows and the number of columns. Um, it repeats it again here, how many rows there are. So you can see it in a mul multitude of ways. Um, and then if you want to look at just the names, you got column names. Um, Glimpse is yet another way to take a look at, it, it organizes it a little bit differently. It puts the columns here on the left side, everything kind of running off to the side. Um, yeah, so those are all just different ways to view it, depending on your preference, depending on what you're looking for, you can uh, view it in different ways. So, <clears throat> In the dplyr package, all of the like the general structure of the, the different functions are the first argument is always a data frame. Um, this makes it's really easy when you're using the pipe function, which we're going to talk about in just a second, um, because then that argument is kind of automatically put into all of the functions when you use them. So you kind of have to only put that in one time. Um, and then all the other ones are going to be operating on the columns and the output's going to be a new data frame. So unless you save it, it's just going to be a view of the new data frame, depending on the criteria that you put in. Um, you can 
manipulate it and create a new data frame and then assign it to a variable. Um, and I, I think we're going to get to that in just a minute here as well. Um, like I said, the pipe function, I don't know if it's a function, the pipe operator, I guess, um, makes this whole thing super, super easy. Um, it's just a, a simple way of organizing all of the different functions that you're going to run through in order to create the visual that you want, or create the data frame that you want. So it's when you're reading it out loud, you can say, and then. So this code right here, you would read it as you're taking the flights data set, and then you're going to filter it, looking for destinations that are just going. Uh, I think this is, uh, I don't remember what airport that was, but that's the airport code that you're filtering for. Um, <clears throat> and then you're going to group it, and then you're going to summarize. And if you haven't seen any of these functions yet, we're going to be talking about all these in turn. Um, but that's kind of the the bird's eye view of how this works when you are um, transforming your data using the dplyr package. So before we get into the specific function, starting with filter, are there any questions so far? I just wanted to add um, or add a couple things, and I don't think it was talked about in this chapter, but it will come up here with like dplyr, some of the like the basics of it dplyr won't explicitly change your data. So yes, it allows you to view it in certain ways. You can do like different aggregations, you can do filters. You have to explicitly assign a variable to actually change your data. And I think that's a really important design decision to consider because like even all, even if you write like a pipe or chains of pipes or like a, a statement with pipes, it doesn't change your underlying data. It's only going to change it if you explicitly assign a variable to it. Um, and then with the pipe, and someone can confirm this because there's that mix up between the old McGritter pipe and then the new pipe. I think the new pipe is considered an infix operator. Someone can confirm that for me or not, but I think it's considered an infix operator. Not It's kind of like a function, but it's a different type of function. I don't know. Someone else can jump in and see if they can answer that for me, but I think it's considered an infix operator. Um, but yeah, Amber does ask. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I don't. I don't exactly know what an infix operator is, but the both pipes work pretty much the same in all, in most cases. The thing is, the the old pipe, the one with the percentage. What I have found is that it doesn't take. A, a period for an argument. So you can't uh, write a function, for example, here, we're saying filter destination. I don't know if you were to use and summarize, uh, you could put period, comma, and then something else. And it knows it's about this data set that you're working with, but sorry, that, that one does take it. The new one, the the bar with the arrow doesn't take that. So for somewhat more complex and kind of function writing, uh, you have to keep in mind that. Yeah, yeah you have to write an anonymous function for that purpose. So there is workarounds if you want to do the native pipe. So that's the one with a bar and the greater than sign. So there are workarounds for that, but it's true. You don't have the placeholder with the period. You don't have the placeholder. Yeah, that's that's the way. Thank you. Yeah, that's something that's tripped me up with the with the with the new pipe from Basar, which Trevin kind of cleared up here a little bit. Um, yeah, I, and just to kind of, I think we'll talk about it here in a second. So I know Tosan has an, a, a question here. How does assigning? Oh no, excuse me. Someone asked about old pipe and everything, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But to clear up Tosam, what I was saying about does it change the data? So if you look at what Austin has here, it has this statement right here. It will just create this view for you in dplyr. Like using dplyr code, it will create this view of the data. However, this is not an object in your environment that you can use. You have to assign that in your environment to actually use it later on, whether you're going to visualize it, create some type of table. So just writing a dplyr chain of code is not going to actually change your data until you explicitly assign it to something in your environment. So um, yeah, cool. All right, Tosan got it. So cool. Sorry, Austin, I didn't want to 
clarify no, that's my okay. statement there. No, that's good. Uh, I think it's good to go over. I was just going to jump here to the pipe section since we're already talking about it. Um, <clears throat> in, in case it, we, it wasn't clear when we were talking about it, that's not a lowercase l. That's the bar that's right above the enter button on your keyboard. Um, there is a shortcut to it, which is um, control shift M or command shift M, and it enters that pipe operator for you, which is super convenient. Um, so this is what it would look like if we didn't have the pipe operator, having to nest different functions inside of each other. So hopefully it's obvious that that would get really messy really quickly when you're doing multiple steps and, and multiple filterings and things. Um, <clears throat> and then this is, this is a decent example, I guess, of um, that assignment that Colin was just talking about, where you can filter your flights data set and then assign it to this new variable called flights one and then it's saved and then you can if you wanted to um you could do different manipulations with that new flights one data set because now it's stored otherwise it's just a view and it's not saved in in your environment it's not saved in any way all right um <clears throat> excuse me so we'll go ahead and jump to uh the first of the functions that are going to manipulate rows and that's the filter so it's just kind of um what the word says it's going to filter based on different criteria that you give it so anytime that the criteria that you give it is true it's going to present that row so the first argument again is a data frame um, but if you're using the pipe that's kind of fed into the filter function for you <clears throat> so in this example you have the flights data set or data frame, and then you're going to filter all of the flights where the departure delay is greater than 120 minutes. Um, so when you do that, this is the output you're going to get. Um, you, there's a different couple different um, things you can add on to it. So if you wanted to <clears throat> use some different like logical operators or um, like you, you can do and and or, so you can say, I want to find all of the flights that departed um, on January 1st. So you can say on month one and on day one. Um, I do want to note here, there's the double equal sign. And I think this, this is in the notes in just a little bit, but I'll go ahead and mention it here. Um, a single equal sign is an assignment operator, whereas a double is, it's a comparing. So it's comparing any month that equals one. So it's going to search for that criteria. So in the filter function, the single equal sign isn't going to work. Um, you can also, you know, here's another example, um, any flights that departed in January or February. You notice here, this is the operator sign that you would use for or instead of and is that same vertical bar. Um, another way to write this because if, if you want to filter by multiple criteria, it can get kind of long. So if you want to say, if you want a January, February, March, and April, you could write out month equals equals one, month two, month three, and it just gets a little bit extended. So if you want to shorten it, then you can use this sign. I don't know what the name of this is, <laughs> um, but you put in, I want to filter by the month, any month that has these numbers, and you can catenate it with the C. And then it's just, it's a condensed way of writing. It's going to do the same exact thing though. Anything that's in month one and month two. Um, let's see. Month one, day one. So, oh, here's an example of assigning. So the, the flight, the filtered flights here isn't stored until you save it to this new variable, January one. Um, so you can do just like in any other um, functions, you can do greater than, you can do greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to. Again, the double equal sign for equal. Or if, if you wanted, you could say anything that's not January 1st, you could do exclamation equal. And then you also have the and, you have the vertical bar, which is the or. And then again, you have the exclamation mark, which is the not, the, the negating. Um, any questions on the filter function? 
So I just confirmed the in. So the percent in percent is known as an infix function. Again, if you're somebody that's coming to this new, you don't need to know the detail of that. But there is a section in another book called Advanced R that talks about it. Um, if you're interested, I'll drop it in the chat. But again, it's it's known as an infix operator. There's several of them available in R, but it's just a convenience that's available. So I don't know. Anybody else want to add anything? Go ahead. Please do. Um, I was chatting with a friend of mine who's been doing this for a while, and he said that he defaults to this anyway, even if there's just one criteria that he's filtering to, just out of habit, it's just easier for him. Um, as soon as you're going to start adding multiple criteria, then it's easier when to use this because it's shorter. So, um, I'll also add that R by default doesn't have the opposite of N. Um, so if you wanted to do not in, um, you can actually create your own infix operator. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about functions later on, but um, just know that that's an option. Are you saying like if you wanted to do the exclamation mark here, so anything that's not January 1st or 2nd? Or yeah, February? basically you could call it like, I'll type it in the chat, like not in or and define. Oh, okay. Basically, have it do the exclamation. That's cool. I didn't know you could do it that way. That's good to know. And I can, I can share like a snippet in the chat. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Um. So a couple. Common mistakes, uh, we've already talked about some of these, uh, using a single equal sign instead of a double. Because again, the single one is an assignment operator versus this, which is comparing. Um, luckily, uh, dplyr is going to give you a nice little message that tells you that's probably the mistake that you made. So it's really easy to catch if that's what you write. Uh, another common mistake is to write these or statements like you would write it in English. So in English, you'd say, I want to filter by month one or month two. And so you just put in the two, but basically if you if you do it this way, then what R is reading is where the month is one or where two. And logically it just doesn't make sense. It's looking for a row where two is true. And so that, that doesn't really make sense for R, so it's not gonna work. So you'd have to put month equals one or month equals two. So I have to be really explicit in saying it if you're going to do multiple um, or statements this way. Okay, um, the next the next function for dealing with rows is arrange. Um, and it's simply just going to change the order that the rows are in. Um, so you can arrange it based on um, you know high to low or low to high. The default is ascending. So big to small to big, but you can use the descending or uh, DESC function to go the opposite direction, big to small. So in this example, you're going to do flights, which is your data frame, arrange by year, month, day, and departure time. So it's going to take each one of those in turn. So it's going to return a data frame where everything is arranged by year first, so starting at 2013. And then it's going to arrange month. So it's going to start in January all the way to December. And then within the month, it's going to arrange by day. So it's going to be one up to 31. And then within those, it's going to arrange by departure time. If you wanted to flip it around and have it go the opposite direction, so you wanted the higher departure times, then again, you could do the descending. You'd have the departure delays the longer delays at the top and the shorter ones at the bottom. Um, and I was curious about this, so I looked it up. If you wanted to do the same thing where you are arranging by all four of these columns, but in descending order, then you would just put this descending function in front of each argument. So you'd put descending year, comma, descending month, if for some reason that's what you wanted to do. So uh, the arrange one is fairly straightforward. Um, are there any questions with the arrange function? Okay. 
I, I just wonder if your trick, because I was wondering that too, because I, I'm thinking about the descend. Can you create a vector of those variables and then just pass it into one descend? I'm not sure if that's, I might have to play around with it, but if anybody can answer that question for me quickly, that would be good. Like, yeah, I don't it would know be that. a range. <clears throat> it would be a range, descend, C, for concatenate year, month, day, department time. I don't know. That's what I was thinking that would be the solution that you could maybe try to instead of doing descend, 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 but I have to yeah, play around if, with it. But if that works, that would definitely be a better way to write it. So if someone wants to look into that while I keep going, that'd be awesome. Um, distinct function, what it's going to do is find unique rows in a data set. Um, this is super handy if you want to find out um, you know, things that are unique, things that are, are uh, distinct. <laughs> Um, if you just run distinct without any additional arguments, it's it's looking at the entire row as a whole, and it's going to look for distinct rows. So if you're not running any additional arguments, then this, running this distinct by itself is just going to delete any, or not delete, but it's going to remove from this view any duplicate rows, because it's considering each like there's not going to be any row that has the same year and month and date and departure time and scheduled departure time and like where everything is the same. You could put in a specific um, column if you wanted to see, for example, in this case, you want to see unique origin and destination pairs. So this is going to return um, all the different flight paths because it's showing where the origin and destination is different than any other row. What this doesn't do is tell you um, how many flights have this origin and destination pair, but we can use counts to do that, which we're going to get to in just a little bit. Um, that's a cool function where it actually will tell you, uh, you know, there's a certain number of flights that have this path and this path. <clears throat> um, by default, if you put in the, you know, these columns, origin and destination, it's going to only show you origin and destination. So if you wanted those distinct columns, but you also wanted to see the other columns, you could use this um, dot keep all equals true. And then it's going to still show you all the columns that were in the original data set. Um, but you'll notice there's still 224 rows, just like here, because it's still showing you only the distinct ones. Um, here's the count function I was telling you about. So you could put in count, um, same thing as before, origin and destination. And this sort is just a way to organize it from big to small, um, very similar to what the arrange was doing. So in this case, it's going to show you the number of flights that took each of the, that went from this airport to this airport. Um, so distinct's a good one. I really like using that one. Um, it helps you get a good idea if you're looking for certain, um, you, you want to know how many, I don't know, for example, I was doing a, an analysis on an Olympic data set. I wanted to know like how many countries or um, how many, uh, this data set had um, multiple Olympians. So the same Olympian was repeated in multiple rows because they'd earned different medals and had competed different years. And so you could use the distinct to find out how many unique competitors were there. That's just another um, another good case study for that one. Um, okay, so these exercises, I was uh, talking with Colin about these. I don't, I don't really want to use the time now to go over these um, because there are a lot of functions that I think are useful to go over together. Um, so we're going to talk about columns next, but. I do really want to encourage everyone here, if you are new to this and you haven't had practice with it, to go through these exercises. Um, the question is in this, you know, in the commented out section of each code block. And then if you just try and figure it out without looking at this code first and see if you can figure out how you would filter to to find all the flights that have an arrival delay of two or more hours, or um, you know, whatever questions are presented here. I think these are really good exercises to go through and to get some more exposure and practice using these. Um, OK, before jumping into columns, um, any other comments or questions or thoughts?
All right, we'll keep going. So uh, the functions that we've talked about already are specifically manipulating rows. These next functions are going to be manipulating columns in the data set. So we've got mutate, which is going to create new columns using the columns that are already existing. Select, which is going to um, just choose the ones that you want to view. Rename, which uh, is self-explanatory, is going to change the names and rename the columns. And then relocate, which is just going to change the position of those columns. So starting with mutate, um, this is if I had a favorite function here in this whole chapter, it would probably be mutate. Um, <clears throat> so you can use mutate to create new columns from existing data in columns that are already in your data set. So for example, you have in the flights data set, you have departure delay and you have arrival delay and distance and airtime, but it doesn't come with this gain or this speed column, but you can create them by saying mutate and then gain equals. So this is um, the assignment of what's gonna be in the gain column. The gain column is gonna be the departure delay column minus the arrival delay column. That's gonna tell you how much time was gained in that flight, how fast it went basically. Um, and then the speed column, you're assigning it the distance column divided by airtime, which is in minutes. So it's time 60 to get it miles per hour. And then it's going to create those two new columns, gain and speed. However, you might notice here that you can't see them because, again, by default, they're added to the very end of the data set. So there's enough columns here that you can't see it in the, in the output view. So if you wanted to see it at the beginning, you can use this dot before argument. Um, and there's a couple different ways you can use it. You can put in a number which is the number of the column. So I want it before the first column. You can see here that it shows up at the beginning. You can also put in the name of the column. So you can say dot before equals year and have it right before the year column um, or anywhere in the data set that you want it to show up. Um, <clears throat> this dot after works basically the same way, but it, as you might guess, it puts it after whatever you assign it to and not before. Um, and here's an example where it's using the name of the column instead of the number of the column, but either one works. So here you can see the gain and speed shows up right after day. Um, the other thing, the other argument that you can use is this keep. Um, this is useful depending on what you want to look at. So again, when you put in, when you use this mutate function, it's keeping all of the original columns and then it's adding on the new ones that you created, in this case, gain and speed. But you can use this keep argument to change which columns appear in, in the view when you enter this. So you can use just the ones or have, have the ones that you used appear. So in this case, any column that was used to create a new column, as well as the new columns themselves are gonna show up. Um, it doesn't say it in here. I'm trying to remember the other ones. You have used, you have not used. So basically anything, you know, the opposite of use, anything that you didn't use in this mutate function. Um, I believe you have, if anyone can remember, there's all, I think, which is, is the default to keep everything. And then there's one other one. I don't remember what the last one was. Um, Colin, do you happen to remember off the top of your, no, off the top of your head? Uh, I think it's drop. If if we haven't covered drop, I was monitoring the chat. So if that's been brought up, the drop is the one that comes to my mind because, or no, it's keep all used, unused, none. Oh, so here are the here they are. All is the default, used, unused, and none. There's no drop. Drop is with um, summarize. Um, because I remember the unused. There used to be a function called transmute. I don't know if there's anybody coming here from using older tidyverse syntax or dplyr syntax and was used to transmute, I would just go and use the default.keep to useful, but there used to be a function called transmute where it would do the same thing, where it would just be like, only retain the variables that I'm creating. So, um, but at this point in time, I would just learn to use.keep, but they are all used, unused and none, and they're clearly documented in the documentation if you wanna learn more about them, so. Yeah, 
Yeah, they're all there, which is nice. Um, here's just a reminder. Um, when you create these new columns, gain and speed, unless you assign this new view to a variable, and we might be you know, kicking a dead horse at this point, <laughs> um, unless you assign it, it's not going to be saved at all. So you can view it, but you can't do anything further with it until it's saved by assigning it to a variable, and then you can, then it's stored. Otherwise, it's just a view. I do, okay. I do have a question here from Amber. Um, and Amber, you might have to clarify this a little bit, but and somebody else can jump in. But can you use dot keep to subset the data frame? And I guess I would need to know a little bit more about what you mean by subset. So Amber, if you want to jump, if you want to unmute yourself, you're welcome to do so. But if anybody has an idea of how to answer that question. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, um, I can I can explain. I was thinking, so from the example, if you're creating a column um, and filtering the view, um, that in itself is sort of um, a subset of the original data frame, right? And so if, if that's the case, could you assign it to a new DF as like a subset? Like, could you do DF sub is equal to whatever this um, uh, argument case is for dplyr? Yeah. Um, if, if I understand what you're saying, right, you could say, um, you know, flight speed, assign it to this whole, um, you know, set of functions, um, and then use keep equals use. And it's only going to keep, it's going to keep in the data frame, like it's shown here, all the ones that you used. And then this would be a new data frame that you've been saved, which would be exactly. a set of your original one. Right. So it only it's only keeping right the selected variables that you um that you entered into that argument frame. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, so um the select function, this is just gonna give you a view of the specific columns that you ask for. So you can use select year, month, and day, and it's gonna get rid of everything else and just keep year, month, and day you can use this colon, um, which is basically saying anything between the year column and the day column. And it is inclusive, so it's gonna keep year and day. So, I mean, this output looks the same, but if you're trying to select you know, a dozen columns, putting them all in is gonna be a lot longer than just saying the first one, colon, and the last one. Um, Again, you can use this exclamation mark as the um, negating uh, operator. So you can say everything that's not between year and day, and it'll give you everything else. Um, you can also, I thought this was really cool. This is a cool feature with the select function is instead of just saying the names of the columns, you can ask for specific things such as, I want to select all the columns that are uh, character type. And then it's going to pull all those. You could do anything that's a number. Um, and here are a couple different, um, they're called helper functions that go with select. So you can say anything that starts with certain letters. Um, so in this data set, a really good example for that would be I want to find all the columns or see all the columns that um, are related to departure. So you can say starts with DEP or ends with, um, ends with, uh, time or delay. If you wanted the arrival delay and the departure delay at the same time, say ends with delay. Um, anything that contains certain letters. Or um, I didn't fully understand this one, but I think what this one is saying is if you have multiple columns, say you have an X1 column, an X2 column, and an X3 column, this is just a shorthand way of writing anything that starts with the number X with these numbers at the end of it. I'll, I'll jump in. A great example of this is if like you have a data set that you import and you don't have a header row, which, I mean, if you have to, if you're in that situation, you're probably pulling your hair out, but I've come across that in some areas. It will, the, or uh, read CSV and tidyverse will default. If you import a data without a header row, it will do like X1, X2, X3 as just like the naming for the name of the columns. And so that's really nice in those situations. If you can avoid that, do so. But there's conveniences built in if you can't <laughs> change the data itself. 
Thanks. Perfect. Thanks for jumping in there, Colin. I appreciate it. <clears throat> um, just like anything else, you can do the question mark select for more details on, on some of these helper functions. I believe there's a lot more. Um, and then another nifty little thing about this select function is you can also rename columns if you wanted. So as at the same time that you are um, changing your view to see only the tail number column, you can also change the name from tail num to tail underscore num. Um, in this case, the new name is going to go first, and then the original name is what's going to go after or second. Um, by the way, that's the same with, um, I, I believe, I guess that's like a, the tidyverse structure. That's the same way with mutate. When you mutate a column, the new column name is going to go first and then the, the later column. Same with this rename function, which we're going to talk about right now. Um, in this case, it's, I mean, it's doing the same thing as selected, except it's not going to end up selecting just that one. It's, it's going to change the name, but it's going to retain all the other columns in the view. Um, again, new name first, original name second. Um, this one's super straightforward. Um, there is this nifty, I've used this a couple times. I'm not super familiar with it. Um, but there's this janitor package where you can actually just use the clean names function. Um, and Colin, you're nodding your head. Maybe you want to uh, jump in here and with more experience than I have in this. Um, it just seems like a super a uh, quick way to clean up your data and get it ready for more data transformation. Yeah, I'll let other people jump in and, and, and express their, I love janitor, I love clean names. It is just a great convenience, or it's a package that has some great convenience functions that helps with everything. I don't know, anybody else want to give a thumbs up to Trevin to say like they've used janitor, use it, it's great. It saves you so much time, so. Yeah, I'm going to have to play around with that one more because everyone seems to get really excited when it's talked about. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, Okay, and then the the last function that um, we specifically want to talk about with columns is the relocate. And this is just going to change the position of the columns and change where they are. Um, it's kind of like the um, when you use the mutate and then you have the dot before dot after, it's like a function that does explicitly that, putting it in a certain place. Um, by default, it's going to put the columns that you name at the very beginning. So this is going to relocate time um, and hours and airtime to the front of the data set. Um, but again, you can use the same arguments in, as the mutate function, um, dot after, dot before, to specify exactly where you want it to go. Um, and you don't have to do just one column at a time. Uh, this is going to do anything between year and departure time with that colon. And it's going to put that whole group of columns after time underscore hour. Um, <clears throat> you also have the same arguments as before with the starts with, anything that starts with ARR, um, anything that ends with, anything that contains, all the same helper functions. Um, okay, are there any other questions or comments about uh, any of these functions that we talked about that specifically are manipulating columns? I do want to add one thing for people that may have had some previous use of like mutate. There used to be functions, well, they still work, but they've been superseded. It's like mutate at or mutate if. If you do come across those, because you're probably going to see some old blog posts that use them, I would just default to what's in the book rather than using those superseded functions. Um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about them, but they were just functions that kind of, they do the same thing. Like mutate if would be like, if it's a character vector, then do this or something like that. So if you do come across some of that stuff, that stuff still works. But I would default to what the book is talking about because that's the new syntax that Tidyverse is using so but that's all I wanted to add and I'll open up for anybody else that wants to add comments or questions. Excuse me. 
Great. Um, yeah, so again, I, I wanna encourage anyone um, new to this, everyone new to this is to go through these exercises and just before looking at the code, um, the, the answer, uh, try and figure it out on your own and see if you can't figure out how to uh, get specific views. Um, these exercises are super, super helpful. Um, we already talked about the pipe operator, so I don't have much more to add to this one. Um, other than maybe at this point, you might see that you might want to combine multiple functions in one, um, you know, in, in one instance. Um, so in this case, you can filter and mutate and select and arrange, and you don't have to repeat the, because remember the first argument of all these functions is the data set that you're manipulating. But in this case, you just put it in once, and then it's kind of, it trickles down into all the other ones for you. Um, so it's a really convenient way to stack on different functions and continue transforming your data in however you want and get the view that you are after without having code that looks like this and gets really confusing really quickly. Okay, um, groups. Ooh. Groups are groups are super fun, um, and it allows you to um, get really interesting insights in your data by grouping by certain criteria that you give it. So um, in this first example, you can group by the month. And visually, when you first look at it, nothing's really going to change. But behind the scenes, anything that it has the same month is going to be lumped together. So the later you can do some other functions with it, like summarize, and get some insights about all the flights that happened during the month of January or during the month of February. So just grouping isn't going to change a whole lot, but it does say here, it'll point out that it is now grouped. Um, there are 12 months. Um, so that's like the start of the other steps that you're going to do. So once it's grouped, you can do some cool things like summarize, where let's say you're curious to find out um, the average delay time for flights uh, at, you know, per month you would first group it by month and then you would use this summarize function um, to create the average delay is the mean or the average of your departure delay and then the output here um well it is grouped by month so it has one through 12 january through december but you'll notice that all of the average delay columns are na and that's because each of these groups contained at least one missing um, missing data point. And so when it's summarizing all of them, it's going to, to give you an NA. So to avoid that, you can put in this argument NA.RM. So not of NA remove equals true. And so before it summarizes everything for you, it's going to just not count all the ones that have missing data, only summarize the ones that have data. And then you can see here it groups, it gives you the average of each month. Um, you don't have to group by just one column either, one criteria. <clears throat> you can, oh, I might be getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, I'll get back to that in just a second. Um, in this case, you can create uh, multiple summaries, all within the summarize function. Um, so you are creating the average delay as well as the count in this case is doing both at the same time. And it's going to give you those two new columns. Um, and just if anyone's curious, because I noticed this a couple times as I was working on some things, I believe the summarize function works equally, like it works the same with a Z or an S because I believe those are two different ways to spell it and they both work the same. Um, it did not, okay. The notes that I thought were here, I forgot what I was saying that I said I was gonna get back to, um, but you can, oh, I remember. Okay, so you can group by um, just one column, so group by month, or you could group by month and day and year, and then it's gonna have all those grouped. Um, oh, here it is, grouping by multiple variables. 
So group by year, month, and day. So it's going to um, basically create 365 different groups because each of those unique combinations is, is a unique day. <clears throat> um, and then, like it says here, it's going to kind of peel off from the last group. So this was a little bit confusing the first time I was going through it, but it's it's grouping by each one at a time. Um, I don't know if what I just rambled on about makes any sense. Hopefully it does. Um, I'll jump back here real quick to the these slice functions. These are really nice to get um, specific rows within groups. So there's slice head, which is going to take the first row from each group. Um, and this n equals 1, you can change it to whatever number you want. So this would take the first. You could do n equals 10, and it will take the, the first 10 from each group. Uh, you could take the last in a group by using slice tail. Um, the smallest value you can get by using slice min. And then the largest value with max. Or you can just get a random sampling by using slice sample. Um, so here, in this example, we're grouping by destination. And then what it's doing is it's going to select the top delayed, so it's looking at average delay, the most delayed flight from each destination. And then it's going to relocate the destination column at the front so we can easily see it. Um, this was an interesting point. Um, you might notice that there are 105 destinations, but this output gave 108 rows. So what it's doing is when you use these slice functions, um, it's going to keep any ties. So any destination where the largest delay was the same, it's going to include both of those. Um, if you didn't want it to do that, you could do you could include this argument with ties equals false. Um, and I believe what it's going to do in that case is it's going to keep the first instance of of the tie um, and just drop the second one. So depending on you know your your uh, situation, you may or may not want to keep the ties. Um, any questions or comments about the slice functions or the grouping? Mike, my, my question was, and this goes back to a range because the ties brought it up, that idea of ties using the slice was how does it handle ties in a range? And I think it's, I think you mentioned it, it's by position in the data set. So if it does come across the tie, I don't know, I'll have to confirm that. But that was the question that came in my head was like, oh yeah, I never thought if there wasn't a range and there is a tie, how does it determine the tie or the order of the tie? Um, yeah, but I think it's by probably- position. It is okay, okay, thanks. I know that definitely. And so you can be very deliberate and use a range before you do your slice max or slice min. So you can kind of uh, reproducibly always get the consistent result. Otherwise it might be unexpected, right? So, yeah. Yeah, because I had, I had a question about that the other day because there's another function called top n. I'm not sure if we're going to get to that in this, but somebody asked me, well, what happens if you take a range away? And I was like, oh, I don't know the answer to that question. And I think it's probably it it's, it has to deal with ties, right? If you take away that arrange, it's gonna your ties aren't gonna be in order that you would expect it to be. So, yeah, awesome, cool, thanks, Stefan. Perfect, yeah, thanks, you guys. Um, I talked about grouping by multiple variables already. Um, there might be cases where you have grouped in order to get certain visuals or uh, manipulate your data in a certain way, and then you need to ungroup it. Um, there are like a handful of ways you can do this. Um, the most direct, I guess, would be ungroup, the ungroup function. Um, <clears throat> and then anything you do after ungroup is just going to be done. It's going to treat the entire data set as one group, um, which there's an example of that in a moment. Um, you can also do, it's not showing it here. Um, Oh, okay, here's the example I was just talking about. Uh, when you've ungrouped and then you summarize, it's going to treat the entire data set as one group. So when you do the same summarize function as before and you're looking for the average, it's going to average everything because it's not counting each month as its own group anymore. 
There's also, um, you can group within other functions, which I thought is really interesting. So if you want to group just for this summarize function and nothing else, then you can use this by argument. And the, um, the equals is what you want it to group by. So in this case, you want to summarize and group by month. So instead of doing um, flights in the pipe operator, and then you do group by month, summarize, and then another pipe operator, and then ungroup, you can just do this by argument. It's going to group it just for this function, and then it's going to ungroup it. Um, <clears throat> again, you can use the grouping by multiple variables within that by argument, just like you would with the group by argument or function, I mean. Um, and that's just a convenient way of, of um, just containing that grouping to this summarize function is all. Um, again, there's some more exercises. I uh, highly encourage you guys to go through these. Um, and then this case study, I thought this case study was interesting. Um, we have about eight-ish minutes left. Um, so moving from the flights data set to some baseball data, um, here's some more examples of how to use all these functions together. So in this example, we're looking for how often a player hits the ball, which in this data set is recorded with just an H. Uh, compared to the number of times that they attempt to hit the ball, which is recorded as AB. So there's this um, Laman batting data set, which you can get. And first, we're going to group it by player so that we're looking at the stats for each individual player and not as, you know, not as the whole team or the whole major league, but by player. Um, then we can use the summarize function to look at their performance. And here's where we're going to do that calculation of, um, you know, we're looking at the sum of all their hits divided by the sum of all their attempt attempts at a hit. And then we're also going to count it. So there's the performance column, uh, performance summarization, and then the count summarization, which is just all of the hits all together. And this is what we get. Um, also, I'm going to go back real, set, uh, real quick for a second. Um, this pop pipe operator, um, you've probably seen it a couple times now as we've gone through some examples, but you're going to use that at the end of each new function. So you have your data set, you're going to pipe operator, and then you're going to use whatever function you want, another pipe operator, another function. And then if you wanted to do something else after this, you would do yet another pipe operator. Um, <clears throat> so this is, um, I mean, at this point, we, we've kind of learned all of the main tools that you would use for data transformation. This is getting a little bit more into um, the analysis beyond the, the transformation functions that you'd be using. Um, but it's, it's kind of helpful to see the process, I think. Um, it's helpful to use this count um, argument in the summarize, because then you can see some of these baseball players only hit the ball you know, a handful of times. And that's going to throw off your uh, your analysis because they're not going to have the most accurate representation of performance because their count of hit batting is so low. And so in this case, you can use the filter function where n, the number of times that a player attempted to hit the ball, is greater than 100. And then you can, again, use the pipe operator going into ggplot. Um, which I think it's so cool that these work together. So you would pipe operator into ggplot, but then after that, make sure that everything is plus because then you're adding on layers to your visualization and you're no longer piping different functions. Um, another thing you could do with this, uh, actually going back up, you'll notice we saved this uh, new transformed data into a variable called batters. So now you can use batters here. Um, here you can arrange it by performance, uh, descending performance, which is going to put the lowest performers at the top. Um, yeah, so 
So that's about it with, um, those are the, like the main functions you'd be using in data transformation. Um, again, this is kind of the core of data analysis and exploratory data analysis and um, kind of getting a handle on what's inside of your data. Um, are there any other questions or comments or things that you guys want to bring up that I might have missed? I'm yeah, holding Trevin. back to, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Also, uh, I was going to bring up Trevin's just, comment um, here, so go ahead. Yep, that's exactly what I was doing. Um, but there are some built-in, like, warnings that will tell you, like, oh, I think you meant to use a plus instead of a pipe operator if you forget to switch when you start visualizing um, your new data. Yeah, the, the Tidyverse team is really good and they've really made a, a strong focus of like error messages. So another good example of this would be the equals equals with filter. The error message is really good because that's a common mistake that people make. So it's just a good reminder to like read those error messages, read those error messages because it may tip you off to like, oh, I did this one thing that everybody does and I'll just need to fix my silly mistakes. So yeah, that's a great point. I wanted yeah, to say so, I would okay. uh, really use the dot by uh, to group because uh, often you only want to use one operation on your group. In my experience, maybe that's not universal. So to be very deliberate to use group by the function uh, because if you forget to ungroup, you get like weird downstream effects. So the, the dot yeah. by you always, it's only for that one function call like mutate or whatever you're using. And so I find it really helpful to use dot by if I don't know that I have multiple functions that will depend on the same grouping. Yeah, that's a great point. I've definitely run into problems where I forgot to ungroup and things later down the road don't work as well. Or you um, just fall, this... fall into that pattern of just slapping on group onto every one of your deep higher pipelines, which <laughs> is not good either, but I've definitely fallen into that trap, so. Um, this question is for anyone. Um, are there other benefits for using the by argument? Like, are there performance benefits if anyone knows? I do not know. I, as far as I know, it would do the same thing. Um, performance wise, it would give you the same results. In, in my understanding of using it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that I suppose that if you're going to do a number of operations with the same sort of grouping and it's a complex grouping and it's a really big data set using group by at the beginning and then doing a lot of manipulations avoids having to group it with each of the subsequent operations if they're all the same grouping, right? Mm. You know what I mean? If you do if you do a series of functions and then you do a whole bunch of other stuff and then you do a series of some other functions and they still need to be grouped by the same same in the same way, well then you wouldn't have to regroup them because they'd already be grouped. That's one. I don't know. I don't know if that's really valid or not, but it seems like a performance issue because you wouldn't be regrouping. And uh, I think I think grouping is probably pretty efficient, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, I think you might be right there. I don't know. I'm still I'm still experimenting with it, to be honest, Trevin. Like <laughs> I'm I'm like the I'm still going to the old syntax of just grouping it in group by and then going from there. I've just only maybe in the past like six, seven months started using it. So I'm not yeah. I'm not sure if there's an efficiency gain or not. Syntax wise, I I don't know. I I always question when they put experimental on stuff. I know they have a document that talks about experimental. Like right now it has life cycle experimental. So my question would be is, is like, is this an option that could get taken away? Like play around with it, but don't put it into something. I don't know. There is a document out there that they explain what these all mean, but I always get kind of weary of seeing like experimental. Is it going to be, mm -hmm. is it something that they're trying out and they could take away later if it doesn't work? And then all of your code will break when it's gone. So hmm. 
I don't know. I, that's the, that's the only thing that I get at. They have a whole document about it and I'll dump it in here for people to see it. And I should probably reread that before I say like it could get taken away, but um, it's just something to consider because this is, this is dynamic software that is changing and Tidyverse is really good at making sure it's stable, but you know, experimental always makes me a little worried. Yeah. Um, Trevin oh. asked, he says he has some code that he uses group by pipe does stuff and pipes and ungroups. I'm wondering if it's beneficial to refactor that code. I would say if it's if it's already written using group by, like, I wouldn't necessarily go back and change it. Just like Colin was saying, in, in future code that you write, maybe experiment with the by and see how you like it, if it works uh, for what you want to do. But I wouldn't worry about changing anything that's already existing using the group by. One of the other things to consider is if you do the use of function to group by, it's more explicit, right? So it's uh, not as easy to miss that someone grouped to generate or do whatever. So it's also a little bit more explicit to read, while yeah. someone else who might not have uh, as much experience might miss the dot by, right? That's one of the other things because it's just an argument instead of a function call. That's true. If you're collaborating with others on the code, that might be easier. Perfect. Yeah, I do want to highlight we are at time here. I mean, we could hang out and keep talking here a little bit, but I know if some other people want to jump off, like feel free to do so. Um, I appreciate awesome, awesome work. Thank you for taking the time to lead us through and taking the time to prep. I really appreciate it. I do want to highlight that the other person I was going to take next week, um, unfortunately, had another commitment. So it's going to default to me if nobody takes it, but if somebody wants it, I want to give everybody the opportunity to do it. It's a short chapter, so it's a great opportunity to get your feet wet and with presenting. But if anybody wants it, take it. If not, I'm more than happy to take it. But I just want to open it up to the group before I just default it to myself. So but other than that, I'll hang out for a couple more minutes if anybody wants to chat about some stuff. But for the people that have to go, have a good rest of your week, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Any other additional questions or anything else that anybody wants to talk about with the time that we have left?